take long. Our speaker, Ed Bice, is founder of Medan.org. He has spoken at iMug before. As I said, uh, he's been doing some really interesting projects all along. Really happy to have him here. Uh, I don't know, Iris, if you want to say a few words or no, he's, she wants to move it right along. Good. So uh, um, you, you can read, right? So I'm not going to read that to you. Uh, and there's lots more info on their blogs and so on. Now, uh, for those who are new, just want to emphasize that Meetup's going to nag you later about whether you like this talk. They're not asking about the traffic on Willow Road. That's, that's, uh, there is a spot to rate the, lo the, uh, the location. Uh, but about the speaker, that's, you know, the first stars you see will be about Ed's talk. Joe, uh, Iris, thanks, uh, and to Facebook for hosting the event. I really appreciate it. Um, the rating, let's talk about that first. The, the, the speaker rating, all of these social incentive systems need reciprocity to be democratic. So I will be rating every one of you based on your rating of me after the, and, and I, I just keep that in mind as you're rating. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm going to work from some notes, and and but but um, uh, I, and I, I have some excerpts from 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 uh, Paul's writing that I'm going to read. So, for the standard iMug uh, uh, um, uh, attendees, uh, and, and for those who saw my last talk at Apple, which was more technical, this is not going to be a terribly technical talk. Um, uh, it's it's going to be more about storytelling, and uh, and I'm going to describe what I think is one of the most inspiring, inspired projects that uh, that has been uh, attempted uh, in in uh, uh, journalism and and. Uh, uh, in uh, ethnography, really, uh, in in our modern uh, history, and uh, I'm going to uh, talk about that project. I'm going to talk about uh, our role in that project, and and uh, and then I'll leave a uh, a bunch of time at the end for, uh, or I hope a bunch of time at the end for questions. So, um, first off, uh, to give you some context, uh, I work at Medan. Medan is uh, a rare uh, company. It is two companies in one. Uh, it is and was for many years a nonprofit, uh, and a nonprofit that had as its mission uh, uh, tackling the language divide in uh, digital domains to the betterment and furtherment of uh, global peace, knowledge exchange, and, and all of those good things. It's also a for profit. So we have a separate entity uh, in which the nonprofit has an ownership stake that now pursues commercial contracts. We've been doing software design and development for 10 years in the space. We have some IP. Uh, and uh, so our, our uh, broader goals of uh, sustaining our efforts until the web is as multilingual as it should be uh, are served by this, uh, by this uh, double uh, 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 corporate structure. So um, our work is expressed in two projects. Okay, one is uh, CheckDesk. This is run through our uh, nonprofit. Uh, CheckDesk is uh, a very interesting project. Uh, just today, we announced a partnership with Google News Labs, Storaful, reportedly, and a bunch of the leading uh, figures in the in the uh, citizen media. Uh, uh, verification and, and citizen media journalism space. Uh, uh, so Check Desk is a fantastic project. I encourage you to check that out. Bridge is our commercial project. It's, it's uh, a platform for translating social media. And you're going to get a little preview of Bridge today. And, uh, and you'll all be able to download it onto your phone in a matter of a few months or so. So. Um, Context. Uh, through the years, we've been involved in uh, many of the notable social media translation efforts. Um, our work began in 2006, 2007 with Salim Rukos and his team at IBM. And, uh, and at that time, we anticipated what social networked translation might look like. 
Um, we probably should have stuck with the social networking part of that because that was about the same time that uh, Zuck was uh, launching the Facebook. So um, we've we've nonetheless been really uh, fortunate to work on a bunch of projects. We've been in the middle. We were working in Cairo in Egypt in 2008. We had deep networks there. So when the revolution happened, we were translating media for the Speak to Tweet project. Um, uh, we also ran a, a very active Facebook uh, page around uh, Arab Spring. And uh, uh, um, my colleague Anjou Mina uh, launched the Ai Weiwei English project. So in the history of translation of social media, Medan's had its fingers in a lot of the, the uh, interesting and informative work in that space. And, and uh, so much so that I, I taught a graduate level course in translation as, a, as an essentially monolingual uh, designer, uh, but, but, but uh, uh, at the AUC in, in Cairo. Uh, two years ago, and, and so, so our roots in social media translation are deep. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and this is, this is uh, a view of some of the, the work that we did. Um, Iranian revolution there on the bottom, uh, news.medan to the far left, the Ai Weiwei project, speak to tweet. All of these projects um, involve communities gathering around emerging events, around uh, important historical figures, and, and, and generating translations that then allowed their words to be shared out to a global community. Um, so with that background, uh, our advisor, uh, Ethan uh, Zuckerman from the MIT Media Lab, uh, came to us uh, two years ago and said, hey, I'm advising on this really fascinating project. Would you guys, by any chance, want to be involved? I said, yeah, tell me more. So uh, tonight I'm going to talk to you about uh, what this is, has evolved into. Um, but before I do that, I, I thought that I should map this talk. Um, so I do so because I have an undergraduate degree in philosophy, and, and, and this is uh, essentially a license to lose one's way. Um, and uh, I have a very a favorite quote from, from my favorite philosopher, Wittgenstein. He said that, that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, um, uh, the, the tendency philosophers have to chase ideas around corners and encounter with your forehead the sturdy wall that understanding finds at the limits of language is the essential philosophical dilemma. So I do not want to find that wall. I do not want to uh, run up uh, uh, and, and uh, bump my head on the wall. So, so here is a map. And as you'll see, this map is... Uh, uh, going to take us uh, from, from from greetings uh, to, through to to the the Q and A, and and we're going to touch and and I say this by way of warning, okay? We're going to touch on uh, endangered languages. We're going to touch on linguistic diversity. We're going to touch a little bit on internet language distribution. We're going to talk about uh, social media that was generated in the year A D three twenty four. Then we're going to move over to a product discussion of bridge for social translation, what slow ethnography means, uh, a, a dollop of a product roadmap, and, and then a farewell. We're going to accomplish this all in the next half hour, so hold on. Okay. Um, uh, starting with the, the project that guides our work. Um, Paul Salapek is quick to disarm efforts to center this walk on his story. And this humility is exactly what, what makes him the perfect journalist to take on what is likely uh, the first effort of a single human to trace the evolutionary path of humankind. Uh, this is a 50,000 year uh, uh, path represented here in this map. Uh, these colored layers uh, each represent uh, 5,000 
uh, years of evolutionary history. So starting 60,000 years ago from the uh, uh, Rift Valley uh, and moving through to Tierra del Fuego, uh, fossil remains show us that this was a, a steady migration over, over a 50,000 year period. Um, so the, this, and I should say this map is uh, uh, the work of Jeff Blossom at the uh, Center for Geographic Analysis at Harvard University. Uh, who in Harvard and Jeff have been very involved in the project. Beautiful uh, maps that they've generated. Um, I want to read a little bit, and I want to kind of set the tone here with some images and some of Paul's writing. Paul says, My approach has always been immersive. I don't try to compete with the big guys like the New York Times who go in, cover stories very thoroughly, and then leave. I stay. I seek out quiet points of the world where there is no news. Usually that means something is happening there, but no one is interested yet. I spent a decade in Africa. I've covered Latin America, Central Asia, the Balkan Wars, and the Middle East. I've always recorded current events by going to places, getting out of vehicles, and using my body as the main tool of collecting information. When I'm in Africa, on the Congo River, I want to get in the pierogi boats with the fishermen. In Mexico, I like to work on a ranch for a year and see how that figures into narcotics or whatever I'm covering. It's an anthropological way of doing journalism. The notion of connecting it, he continues, by walking is the only innovation in this project. I thought rather than flying into places and doing immersive journalism and then leaving, why not walk to the next story? That's where this idea came from. I love Africa. I know a lot about the science of human origins. So I thought, why not combine my scientific background, remember Paul was trained as a biologist, with my anthropological bent and my interest in current events by retracing this dispersal of humans out of Africa 60 to 70,000 years ago. So here's Paul in, in fine form, trekking the uh, deserts of Africa, his camels in tow, and uh, and and uh, you know, setting out every morning and and trying to clock between fifteen and twenty miles, and doing this on a daily basis for seven years. Imagine that. So you might be wondering uh, where this beautiful, inspired project intersects with translation in the multilingual web. To answer this question, meet Christina Calderon. So, Christina Calderon is the last full-blooded speaker of uh, an endangered language called Yaghan. Um, she lives in Tierra del Fuego, which is the finishing point of Paul's journey. And Paul started his journey by traveling there. He had researched uh, and found in his research, found Christina's story. So, he went to Tierra del Fuego before he started the, the, uh, his walk to meet Christina and talk with her. And this next quote is just so beautiful. Uh, Paul says of that meeting, it was, it was symbolic. A pre-walk pil pilgrimage to the finish, finish line. I'd heard about Christina through my research. A lot of what I'm writing about is the reclamation of memory. So I wanted to meet her. More than 5,000 human languages are in peril. I want to carry this woman's words with me metaphorically across the world as a small light. I recorded her words, and I hope she's still there when I make it to that part of the world. You have to start a circle somewhere to close it. She was the start. Which brings us to our role in the project and, and our interest in Paul's walk around the world language. As those of you in this room are well aware, there are estimated to be more than 7,100 human languages. Mo the vast majority of those spoken. It's held that a human language is dying every 14 days. This is a unique framework for organizing and understanding the world that is erased every 14 days. When we think about the pharmacological benefits of rare plants in the Amazon jungle, 
we think about the medical benefit of that. What of the humanity that's lost when we lose a whole framework for understanding what it means to exist? At this point in the history of the internet, it's both the most remarkable hope for language preservation and in its current incarnation, a driver to linguistic homogenization. According to internet world stats, only 16% of users do not use a top 10 language. However, projecting this data forward, we talk about the next billion internet users, and to me this is an enormously hopeful figure here. Um, we projected the data forward from internet world stats. I'd love to have some better data from Facebook. Don't tweet this out. Don't quote me on it. When I'm ready to publish this, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with a, I'll, I'll let you guys know first. But uh, we estimate uh, that non-top 10 languages by 2020 are going to grow to be 35% of the internet. This is nearly going to equal the, the reach of the two largest languages, English and Chinese combined. Uh, the point this, uh, our, our senior advisor, Stephen Bird, uh, who's the author, some of you may know, of the Natural Language Toolkit uh, and, uh, and uh, the founder of the Ikuma Project, is working on field uh, collection approaches to language preservation. And it is our hope that a significant piece of our work over the next five years as we follow Paul around the world is to put in place the linguistic data repository that will allow communities of internet users coming to common translation problems to contribute their work into repositories so that emerging internet languages, underserved languages, can have the linguistic data resources they need to do fundamental things on the internet. It's a big project. Um, it's Stephen's life work, so in some ways we're just trailing uh, behind his work, but uh, I think that uh, Paul's walk and the, and the unique uh, opportunity that presents to touch on dozens of language communities around the world might set the stage for this. In fact, Stephen argues that the only real hope for doing the sort of scaled linguistic preservation work needed to save thousands of spoken human languages is to leverage the ubiquitous internet to crowdsource those data sets. Uh, for companies like Facebook, this presents a grand challenge they're uniquely positioned to address. Iris. Um, <laughs> so uh, we hope this will guide our work with Paul and, and, and be a, an important part of it. Um, however, we've, we've still not connected the thread between slow journalism, a walk around the world, and social media. To make that connection, we have to travel back in time to the Egyptian town of Oxyrhynchus. And here you see the Oxyrhynchus papyri, social media from AD 342. Oxyrhynchus is a city uh, a few hundred miles south of Cairo where an incredibly dry climate kept this, these uh, notes intact for almost 2,000 years. The discovery of these missives sent between friends and siblings hardly compares with the archaeological grandeur of the pharaohs of Tutankhamun. But the way that these lost ephemera give us a glimpse of the real concerns and aspirations of people, I think, and I would argue, is, is uh, as profound as, as the, uh, as the uh, golden headdress of Tutankhamun. Uh, Sen Soteris the puppy, wrote someone named Akulis to a friend, since she now spends her time by herself in the country. If you write to me, you will have done me a favor, for we shall have the impression through our letters of seeing one another face to face. These are beautiful. I could imagine these, maybe with slightly different grammar, existing on Facebook today. When Paul and I first spoke about his project, he explained to me his philosophy of slow journalism. 
and and I want to read a bit about that. It's this, the spirit of this goes through our work. To be slow is an insult, an epithet, a flaw. If you are slow, you get scooped, you get left behind, you become irrelevant, you fail. The adoration of speed is only intensified as the web takes the lead in disseminating news. Thousands of micro-headlines bloom every day, every hour across the globe. Watching breaking news headlines churn online is like watching plankton surfacing and sinking ceaselessly, endlessly, and in the end, incomprehensibly, on a vast yet shallow digital sea. This is why I'm walking across the world. Read words like that, talk to this man, and you are going to come behind him. You're going to put all of your organizational efforts into working for him with no funding for a period of many months. That has changed. I'm really pleased to, to share. Um, oh, this is being recorded. Thank you, Knight Foundation um, and, uh, and uh, National Geographic. Uh, Q&A might ask some questions about that. I welcome them. Um, so... Uh, what I, the, the way that slow journalism connects to our work is uh, uh, the digital form of slow journalism. So the, the essential uh, strategy that Median is taking with this project is to build a digital ethnography based on the tweets and Instagram posts, and we hope public Facebook posts that surround Paul while he's walking. The tool that we're using to generate these views is Bridge. Bridge is uh, the first product that will be released through Medan, through our for-profit Medan Labs. And it's uh, a, a mobile digital authoring solution for social media that, that looks at linguistic properties of social media and provides affordances for translators to offer real-time translations, uh, revise those translations, rate them. Um, the partners that we have in this work, uh, first off, we, ne we needed a partner to help us geolocate these tweets and Instagram posts. And the University of Kentucky and the Oxford Internet Institute have been conducting uh, research that uh, has been aggregating uh, social media, all of the, the world's strongly geolocated social media, which means social media that's coming from a mobile device with their location setting opt-in turned on. So this is, this is lat-long pinpointed social media. They have those all on servers. Every 100 miles, Paul stops, takes a lat-long setting, gets a timestamp. Uh, Patrick, the project manager from out of Eden Walk, sends us that lat-long, that timestamp. We ask uh, uh, Matt Zook at uh, Dolly Project to generate a temporal and geo radius sampling of all the social media from that setting. It's like we're uncovering this digi these digital artifacts that, that have this location and this place and time, and it's fascinating. So the Dolly Plot Project, which has this incredible, uh, uh, the floating sheep is, and, and you can read extensively on why it's called floating sheep, but uh, uh, the Dolly Project is, 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 a, is a really excellent partner to this project. They, they, they have a unique repository and, and one that we want to uh, encourage Facebook engineers to uh, contribute to and to help us get uh, strongly geolocated public Facebook posts into that repository. Uh, but, but we couldn't do the project without them, so I want to give them a lot of credit. Um, the second part of the process, so we have all of these tweets, okay? We've, we've got, and, and Instagram posts, we've got this stew of maybe 10,000 samples uh, in many languages. Next, we have to curate those, okay? So this is non-trivial. It's a lot of work. <laughs> and Anja Mina, Anas Katesh, members of our team, and members of Translators Without Borders helped curate that initial data set. 
and we select between 25 to 100 of those to send off to our translation team. So we've partnered on the translation work. Um, uh, Iris is a board member, I understand, of Translators Without Borders. I discovered this today. Um, and uh, so we have a great uh, uh, relationship with Rebecca and her team at, at uh, TWB. And uh, so they take in this work and generate translations. They also, uh, with our team, work to annotate those translations. Um, social media translation is unique because context is critical. Uh, informal language, uh, hashtags, uh, neologisms, it doesn't translate without annotation. So um, here you can see uh, this, is, this is the first prototype. So this is what we started running just a few months after Paul reached out to us. We had, we had managed to cobble this together. And uh, so this is an early incarnation of, of the project that's running on our open source journalism software, actually. So, so in, the, in the best spirit of the scrappy hackers, we used a platform that was designed for journalists annotating social media around fact checking to provide an annotation and translation framework for Out of Eden Walk. And uh, you get a sense for... Uh, the 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 uh, um, posts here. There's one. There's one uh, 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 YouTube video here in the comment uh, is in Hebrew, and it says, "I know it's old, but I can't stop listening to it." Uh, and then this crazy Wadi Rum snowstorm here. There's an Instagram photo there. These are just, they just all stitched together and they give you a sense for uh, what people in the place are saying. This is the, this is the next version here. We're calling this the point seven. So this is a multi-column view. Oh, oh, I got ahead of myself. I'm going back. Okay, my apologies. Okay, that's Wadi Rum. Okay. Oh, this is, uh, this is a view of the spotlight on, uh, at milestone 23. So every one of these milestones, every one of these 100-mile uh, increments, we're generating this list. And so if you go on to uh, the Out of Eden Walk site on National Geographic, search for Twitter Spotlight or Social Media Spotlight, you can see the... Uh, the, the uh, for every milestone, we've generated uh, this view. And you have the source, you have the translation, and then you, and then you have any available notes. So here we've got uh, uh, now the multi-column view, which is the point seven. And uh, this now, each one of these columns is a, is a separate embed. And uh, so, so we're able to stack up multiple milestones, individual media objects with the annotation, the translation, and that source embed can be shared out, and the entire column can also be shared out and embedded. Um, here's uh, a close-up of the, of the um, single object. Now, what I want to say about this is that this is, uh, we, you know, that Facebook's a great place to talk about hacking, right? It's the culture. This is a hack. Right now, Social media is not wired for translation, okay? The, the, the data models of Facebook and Twitter don't accept this idea that a post lives in a bunch of different languages. So we have to, we have to work around this. And, and so our workaround here is to create uh, a sharing feature that allows you to embed this entire object, um, also allows you to screenshot it and share it out. So that screenshot will just generate a ping file that uh, you, can, you can then push out to whatever social media you want. Uh, so this, this, this is a near-term solution for something that will be addressed by Facebook and Twitter, we predict, in the next <clears throat> few years. So, plus or minus. Um, so here's version 1.0. So this is what we hope to see later this fall. And it's more stylized. Uh, it has uh, tagging uh, and the location information is a little more prominent. 
Um, and it also allows uh, collaborative translation and versioning of the translations. So uh, those earlier uh, screenshots, one translator, that's it. Here you'll see there are a couple translations submitted on this one. Um, this was an actual piece of translation from one of the milestones. And this was, uh, uh, this one came out of uh, Saudi Arabia. And, and uh, is such a beautiful, th this, this went viral, actually. This, this translation went viral. Um, it's, it's, it, it deserves reading. Um, so this, this uh, user in Saudi Arabia wrote, all that connects me to you is a bunch of electronic devices. If humanity goes back to its primitive state, I would lose you forever. Beautiful. So, um, where is Bridge heading? So, uh, I promised some, you know, insight into into uh, into where we're going with the technology. You're first to hear uh, an I iMug world premiere of. Uh, of a roadmap for, for the bridge product. Um, so three pieces of, of development work are happening. First is a language graph. Uh, and the language graph is intended to be a repository for linguistic data that's specific to social media. So language graph uh, is, can be thought of as a translation memory. But as our advisor, Kevin Scannell, says, Translation memory, doesn't matter if it's a word, it's a phrase, it's a full sentence. Throw it all in the same bucket, it's translation memory. If you can pair that up and make it available to translators, great. Language graph also brings in contextual information and serves up the translation memory based on that contextual information. That can include the reputation of the translator. Uh, it can also include the locale of the source or uh, the uh, or, or any uh, geographic information about the translator. So geography plays a real role in, in the way that internet dialect organizes. So, so language graph is intended to be a smart translation memory for social media. Reputation system. Um, uh, a, a big challenge in doing social media uh, translation and especially revisions is deciding how to surface the best material. And so we've, we've uh, developed a reputation system that sits behind Bridge. And uh, the reputation system essentially gives higher reputation to translator more voting power in the system. It's, it's not a totally novel uh, model for, for uh, reputation on the web, but, but it's an important piece. Um, and then analytics. So we're, we're interested to study as some of the first movers in the cross-lingual, what we call the cross-lingual web, to understand how that actually affects user engagement. So we're paying special attention to analytics um, to see how this content performs and to see how the authors of that content perform. It's not just analytics about where the media goes, it's analytics about how uh, brands or or users develop their followership um, with the Ai Weiwei English project they were able to track the the growth in the English language community of attention to Ai Weiwei on the social media and and they were able to draw some some very clear results from that work so um, looking at analytics is is uh, is critical for us um, that is uh, a very quick view across a 21,000 mile walk and across our now year long effort to translate social media around this. Um, I would welcome any and all who are interested to, to reach out to me. Um, follow me, Dan. Uh, look for us on Facebook at me, Dan, and. Uh, and, uh, and stay involved in uh, what we hope will be another five years of working with uh, Paul Salopek and his team at Out of Eden Walk. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. That's just amazing. You know, I, I spent two or three years chasing after him trying to get him to speak, and now you know why. Thank you. Right. Does anybody have questions? Roger's got a mic over. Did he find Christina? 
Uh, he did. He, 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 so he met with Christina. He spent time with Christina and recorded their conversation together. So he has the recording of her language, and, uh, and, and she, she was 84 when they met. That was two years ago before he started, and he's hoping to greet her in five years when he reaches Tierra del Fuego. Oh, he's not done yet. No, he's, he's two years in. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I finished the talk. You might have seen the map of the talk. I finished that. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really fundamental question. Paul is currently in Tbilisi, Georgia. He came through the Caucasus Mountains a few months ago, and he and his guide nearly perished in a brutal winter storm. Uh, he was in the hospital, his second time in the hospital, second time that I know of on the walk. And so he... In addition to visa problems with uh, with Iran, uh, he's he's mending up in Tbilisi and gaining his strength right now for the push across Asia. That that's why I say we're two years in and five years to go. Other questions? Yeah. Does he have a support system? Does somebody drives around next to him to you know, catch him if he falls or no? Lost? He's got a single guide who walks with him. So he, he and his plan is to bring all of the guides that have been with him on the whole walk to join him for the last uh, the last mile of the journey in Tierra del Fuego. So so he he finds local people and and walks with them for as long as they will go and then finds another um he you know occasionally national geographic crews will come out and and uh interview him and photograph him but uh it's it's a uh and andy's got a great support network and he's very active on you know i mean he's he's, he's in communication skype social media but it's i my sense is that it's it's a f seriously lonely endeavor that he's undertaking. And it's another thing. So slow journalism reminds me of slow food movement. Yes. Which has grown very large, right? Yes. So are there other people doing similar things to him? Has he inspired other people? That's a good question. I don't know whether anyone has. I, he's certainly inspired a lot of people. Um, the Knight Foundation, which is kind of the world's leading funder of journalistic innovation, uh, thought enough of his work to uh, launch the the project with a slow journalism uh, event at the museum in in Washington D.C. So they're 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 promoting this flavor of journalism. Uh, and, and in my research for this talk, I did note that there is somebody who's, who's uh, curating articles at slowjournalism.com. So yeah. but there's, of course, a URL. So yes, let's consider it a movement. And I, 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 uh, I, I hope that it gains slowly some traction. Yeah. Uh, regarding the bridge technology, what kind of clients do you have now using that technology? Uh, out of Eden Walk, so that, that that this is our first client. Oh, gotcha. So, um, okay. and we're we're pre pre release right now. So everything that you saw going up here is is uh, we 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 have no no public use of this beyond the out of Eden Walk. Okay. But but it's certainly. Um, uh, it's it's certainly we think uh, a valid tool, uh, and and w w we will seek to to see uh, general users of the tool uh, after re we release it uh, this fall. Okay, yeah. thanks. I have a question. Um, is there going to be a final product at the end of the seven years? Is this going to be? Going into research, uh, some kind of publication, a book. I so there there's there are ongoing products. 
So uh, it, uh, there've been, I think, two cover stories. I know there's been one uh, in National Geographic and a number of feature length pieces. So those are ongoing outputs. Um, we hope, I mean, my dream at the end of this project is Paul writes a book uh, we do some crazy, cool, interactive graphics with all the linguistic data that we create. And we've started the uh, language uh, graph repository of open data. And, you know, we, we uh, are able to look at this body of work across the journalism to the technology to the data. And that all equals this kind of... Well, I could, I could, I could describe it in, in grander terms, but that, you know, th that's my hope. Um, can can I ask one more question and then I give it to you? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so as you translate these tweets using volunteer translators and uh, collect data, uh, do you find that you're collecting a lot of valuable information that you can share with Twitter as they're developing their technology? Are you collaborating with Facebook, other social media? Uh, it, it, the scale of the data that we're collecting is not significant. The lessons that we're learning in translating social media, in the interfaces that we're using, in the authoring, um, that's all uh, very important, and uh, we hope it'll be of great interest to to uh, Twitter, to Facebook, to to any company that that is uh, generating uh, th that has user generated content on the web. Yeah. So <clears throat> I'm interested in, in in the journalistic aspect of this, and and. Journalism is is a, an ambiguous word. Um, it could be journalism in the sense of he's on a journey and it's just recording the events around him. Um, but journalism, to me, the first meaning that comes to mind is more news about an event in, in an area. And where you're capturing some information, people's tweets and, and so forth, and then translating them. I, I know from my experience with, with Yahoo News and some other media that one person writes a story, but there's the other side of the story is perceived by, let's say, say another team if you're recording sports. And, and if you look at, um, for example, Yahoo Answers, if you simply collect the majority vote on what was said and what it means, you very often come up with the wrong answer and it becomes published and it's agreed to. And, and here you have events that are being recorded and maybe, maybe in the community of the, of the web, there's a vote that this is what this means and we all agreed so it must be right. And yet the person who wrote it probably doesn't get a very strong vote on whether that's correct and there may be alternative views what the person wrote may have nothing to do with reality. So from this, this gathering of information and reporting and, and trying to identify what and understand what's really happening in a place, what is your take on how you get there? Because none of the tools that you describe to me really say, we understood this, it's just we somehow measured it and, and came up with something. So maybe you could speak to that. Maybe that's not the intent. Maybe you just mean journalism in the first sense it's, that it, I spoke about. It's a great question, and I would like to talk for the rest of the evening about <laughs> the, the, the um, question of what, what it means to, to be a journalist and to, to report on a thing in the world. Um, I think that the... And, and, and early in our discussions with Paul about what this would be, how we would do this, I think there was more of a, we're going to take a big data approach. We're going to look at the word clouds that get generated by all of these uh, social media objects. And then we're going to be able to determine, we're going to get the digital pulse of this place and and so that was actually the the concept before we came in was 
was we're going to sample the social media, we're going to generate word clouds, and then we're going to translate those. So those word clouds will be in a bunch of different languages. We'll translate them all back to English. This will provide a view into that. And I said, no, you know, I didn't say, we said collaboratively, no, let's look at how we provide more of a mosaic. So I, I, I think that to our work, we're not trying to tell a truth of this place. We're trying to pick out bits and pieces of the thousand truths that describe any one place. And to Paul's journalism, I think that he is, he's very conscious that he's telling the story from his encountering point of view. And slow journalism, in my view, is a hedge against missing because you're going slower um, and, and, and going at the pace of walking, connecting, and, and especially the continuity of the walk, connecting one place to the next is a great way to generate contextual understanding because you know, you know, although, although there's a directionality to that, which you know, computer scientists in the room would probably point out. But um, I, I think that uh, Paul doesn't hope to get at the grand truth. He's telling one person's story of the experience, but it's, it's, I, it's, it's, it's a fascinating question and goes to the root of what it means to be objective, what it means to, to be a journalist who, who captures what's happened. And, and uh, I... I, I uh, you set up the context of all of the languages in the world and the diversity and we're losing information. Yeah. And it, it suggests that somehow this recovers it. But, but in, in fact, that's a, it's a good thought. It's a separate thought. Mm -hmm. it, it really doesn't bear on this. This is one person's journey through a bunch of places and locales. Yeah, but in that journey, uh, you know, there's this flotsam and jetsam of all these digital artifacts, and and uh, I think what we're trying to pick up is 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 some views in that. It's, it's yeah, Gulliver's yeah. Travels. Yeah. Um, yeah. You also got my attention with the check desk uh, platform and the fact checking. Uh, personally, uh, I think that's a daunting challenge, and yeah. uh, maybe the best we can hope for is to provide a, a platform where the fact checkers can uh, put out their uh, their findings, and then people can make up their minds about who they want to believe for the fact checking. My question to you is: Is there a markup language associated with that fact checking? Uh, like there are many other specialized markup languages for even professional specialties. No, there there is not. So, and if you want to help us uh, create that, please be in touch. <laughs>
Can we? <laughs> well, let's hang out for another half hour and uh, chat with Ed. And we've got the break room. Yeah. Less sterile okay. environment. Thanks, thanks, everybody, for braving the traffic, for giving up your Thursday night and, and coming to the talk. And, and do, do be in touch. We'd love to, uh, uh, if, if you're interested in the project, we are building translator community. We are looking for you know any engineers, developers uh, uh, who want to contribute to the effort. There's a lot of this work that is open source. And, uh, you know, and we're also looking for just fans of the project. So please be in touch. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.